Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We have with us Professor Orwin Hess. He holds the Leva Hume Chair in Metal Materials at Imperial, where he's also deputy head of the Condensed Matter Theory Group. He is co director of the Center of Plasmonics and Metal Materials, and he has numerous other uh, prestigious positions, which I shall not list now. He has co authored more than 300 papers. And of these papers, um, some important contributions include um, advances in uh, semiconductor lasers and more, more recently on slow and stop light in metamaterials, which has over 400 citations as of now. Um, so without further ado, let us welcome Professor Alvin Hess, who will talk to us about the stop light laser and optical black hole on the nanoscale. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here. I do have to say, it's my first invitation to speak in front of a, and with a, with a, with a talk in front of an audience organized by a physics society, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I got that invitation to do so. What I would like to do today, and you've seen that at the title, by bringing together something that has to do with light and stopping that light, and something that has to do with lasing. And on the way there, I hope I can convince you that actually what we create there on a scale which is significantly smaller than what the usual black holes exist, namely on the nanoscale, we can have an effect which in some ways is in its effect reminiscent of what one can then see in the black hole effect. But before I sh <coughs> shall start my presentation, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of all those members in my group who have significantly have contributed to, to many of those results that I would like to discuss tonight. We sell our home is at the Department of Physics at Imperial College, and Imperial College itself is in the western part of the center of London, just to Hyde Park here. There's the Royal Albert Hall, there's the, it's where the dinosaurs live, the, the, um, the Natural History Museum and Imperial College embedded between that and the Science Museum over here, the, um, the Victorian Albert Museum over there. Well, the Department of Physics in that corner has also a very nice terrace where we usually, if we try and enjoy the outsides, and in this case it was almost everyone being present, we have the Albert Hall in the background. So it's in particular the contributions of quite many team members that have allowed me to talk about lazing tonight. And I shall start with that. Brought you three lasers. I bought them recently. In a, these lasers, and some of them I have to be a bit careful, and I can only warn everyone that a laser of that type should not be directed to anyone, neither of that type, which is probably the least powerful, nor of this type. You've seen that these, they almost look the same from the outside, but rather internally they have different colors. And they seem to be conveying a different type of information, but they have a very particular color in itself. So what these lasers have in common is that a gain material, and we haven't really discussed what kind of gain material it is, is embedded between two different mirrors that provide some feedback. And if you look at that, how that feedback is provided, we think about the gain material first, then in those transitions that happen in that gain material, Albert Einstein told us next to the fact that a particular light wave or a photon of a particular frequency can be absorbed from one electronic level, let's say in this two-level representation from one level to another level, it can also spontaneously go down from the upper level to the lower level with precisely that energy between the upper and the lower level. He also said that next to that absorbing spontaneous emission, there's also stimulated emission that is allowed, stimulated emission in a way that is triggered by some of the photons that have arrived and triggered not only spontaneously but stimulated emission in this sense. So this stimulated emission is at the heart of every laser process, and we will see that depending on how we realize the particular gain material, we can change the properties, we can change the color of the laser, like you've just seen. But it is also another effect that comes into play, namely the one that is depicted here in this scheme, schematic uh, depiction of the very first laser that was, that was realized based upon that principle. A gain material, as you've seen that before, 
pumped, and we'll see what that pumping actually means in a moment, was pumped by some ways of this flash lamp pumping arrangement. And there's a mirror here, and there's a mirror at the other side. And this schematic arrangement was then realized, and this is now a picture of the original first laser being made by uh, uh, to Maimon in, the 19, at the, in 1960, did already show these two different elements, so-called ruby laser, where the, the color of that, of that rod in between these two different mirrors allowed those transitions to take place. But that depiction of the gain material between these mirrors is now what actually then determines how and what kind of lights exits the laser structure. That feedback, the way we provide that, in this case, determines the, and if we plot the emission gain curve along frequency, depends on how it is spaced in terms of if we have a long cavity or a certain refractive index, the difference and distance between the different modes, those different excitation elements in the laser that allow the light to be existing inside of that resonator. So if I have a long resonator, I might have something like that. And if I have a short resonator, I might get something like this. It's a single mode, but here many modes being present. But how does that look like? Well, some of the resonators might have a very peculiar, very special form. In this case, the form is a loop, a loop of the so-called fiber. And that fiber, if it is supplied internally with a, with, with, a, with a gain material, allows to be pumped, and in this case even to be pumped such that it has a, pati a particular property where it has many colors associated in it. So this type of laser is this very special type of laser. So called supercontinuum laser. But it can even have more special properties. It can have, depending on how that fiber is realized, from the original way of having just pretty much an outer ring and then an inner ring between them, and a more modern realization can consist of a number of different holes that embed inside of that holy structure a little rod-like like, uh, like, like area where the light is confined to an area which can be very small. It can even be so small that it is almost sim um, similar to that experiment that this bus underwent when it's wanted to cross between these two different bus on, on Lumberth Bridge. It's now from one of the Harry Potter movies. And in that case, it needed a good degree of magic to get that bus between these two different buses. But it's pretty much equivalent of what that fiber is doing to the light wave, because it is confined between two different sort of refractive index structures on a scale which is smaller than the wavelength itself. In other words, that bus here that squeezed its way between that squeezed light now being confined to this middle structure to an area which was significantly smaller than the wavelength of the light in itself. And there was a remarkable progression of that large structure from that side that confined the light in a certain channel-like waveguide to an area which was considerably smaller by realizing a fiber where material was deposited in a particular way as to create a reflection environment that was a very, very special way of doing that. And if we do that, we can certainly, uh, we can certainly ask the question, how does that fiber provide that external confinement by these different modes? And we'll come back to these particular structures a little later on in the so-called photonic crystal arrangement by which the periodic arrangement of matter in that way, allowed the confinement of light to such a small area. But it is the gain properties that have the other elements of importance in that laser. And the laser generally has the reflectors and the gain materials in between. We can allow a number of different materials to actually provide that gain to the emission of the laser process. And here, in this case, it is very much one that's is one that is on a scale very, very small and provided through and in a so-called semiconductor structure. We use a laser of that type on a daily basis when, for example, we, we go and pay 
and in one of the tills, and the price of the product is being scanned. It's a semiconductor that emits the light. And in very early realization of such a semiconductor laser structure, it was the application of a current through a series of gain semiconductor materials that provided a, a local area where electron and hole pairs provided the, the required gain for that material. So these semiconductor diodes provided an opportunity to directly link the way that current, that electrons could be converted into light. Well, this very early picture also showed that somehow this little structure here can even become more small, uh, even smaller than that. So a more modern version of this, and this is a scale of about 7.5 uh, 7 microns, uh, shows the layered semiconductor structures being, um, uh, being deposited on top, of it, uh, top, on top of another, and the reflection of the light propagating along that direction being provided by the difference in refractive index between that material and air surrounding it. So we have these two different elements, the gain material and the feedback reflection, which shows us some of the dependence of, uh, on that. A little later on, in the quest to reduce the size of these lasers, people try to, and then literally, take the resonator length and, 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 and change it by, uh, by, by 90 degrees by changing the reflections instead of one mirror to this, this distributed feedback distribution where the gain material is embedded between the forward and back, uh, backward propagating parts. And in doing that, they created a so-called vertical cavity surface emitting structure. And although it's not that long time ago, it is one that has found its way pretty much in every one of those computer mouse structures, computer mouse devices, where the mice then provide the, the, the light that is fed back from a surface in, in, in in the way of the emitted light being produced by a structure of, of, of that type. But one can even go smaller. And very recently, and we'll come back to look at that, it was the addition of our discovery that we had metals that allowed us to confine, confine light to even smaller scales. And, these, and in this example, a metal cap surrounding a very, very thin layer of semiconductor allowed a shrinking of the size of the laser to even, to even smaller, uh, smaller dimensions where the wavelength would indeed be allowed to be confined to a case incredibly smaller than the wavelength itself. So we have an extremely strong confinement of that otherwise semiconductor structure internally. And to take an even step further, the more recent version of, of using that gave us the opportunity to have an interaction between the plasmons confined on a surface, on, on a metal surface, on a scale that is only a couple of tens of nanometers large for wavelength that is emitted about a factor of, of, of about um, at least 10 or sometimes 50 larger than the scale in which the uh, light is confined to. And that strong feedback on a localized structure actually shows that lasing emission is possible by allowing the reflections from this side of the wire to the other side of the wire to be confined in that direction to a very, very small domain. And not only the confinement of the lasing domain was an important element of progression on that, but rather also the fact that light could also be confined in different shapes using a metal core. And while previously it was a wire, we can also confine now light to a structure that has the shape of it, a coaxial cable. Simple, very well-known geometry by which the way that the light is provided in its feedback uh, is, is, is given by the fact how the, how the metal casing surrounds an active area where the feedback then provides the, the light feedback into the gain material itself. But it's in particular, the, just to quick now, I'm sorry, but it's in, in, um, in, in particular the fact that not only the confinement of light, but also the way that this encasing on very, very small scales allowed fundamental processes to be different. Very recently, we showed experimentally and theoretically 
that indeed the normal way that the emission properties of lasers in their dynamics is limited by, um, in, in, in a certain degree, by the combination of the resonators with the material in itself, allowed by freeing that plight from a resonating condition on one and the other side to be, to be not, not only confined, but also extremely fast in its emission properties. So a lot can be changed about that simple lasing structure that is a commodity product by looking at scales which are very, very small. The speed and the way that it is emitted. The, the way that light can not only exist in terms of a resonator, but also in terms of a structure that has holes, and that hole, hole and these holes encompass in, in, in some gain material on the top and the bottom we've recently investigated in terms of so-called metasurfaces. These metasurfaces are literally inspired by a quest to make metamaterials with a certain particular property, and I'll come to that a little later on, and is are literally sheets of sub-wavelength, very, very small, thin, nanometrically thin metal layers with holes inside. And between these whole layers, a gain material would be located. So one would might rightfully ask, Where's the, res where's the feedback provided? And how is the feedback provided in a structure such as that? And we'll see that the particular type of feedback is a very, of a very different kind. In this case, the feedback provided not only to the so-called dipolar, and it's a bit like a, like a different way of seeing that, the dipolar bright modes, but also a particular type of other type of modes, namely the ones that are very special to this metal dielectric metal system, the so-called dark modes. These dark modes are very particular to a structure like that. These dipolar bright mode normal light and these dark modes both carry the information that light normally carries, namely an intensity, but also it carries a certain phase information associated with that. So both providing information on the intensity and the phase, then allowed to, together, determine the way that the emission properties of that light uh, that was emitted from these structures behaved all together. And these properties and their importance for metamaterials in itself, we recently summarized in this bit, bit of a review article that we um, published about uh, two years ago. I'd like to briefly highlight these before moving on to the, another property, namely these bright modes in the way that they in exhibit not only a spatial region inside and between these two different layer structures, but 100 nanometers apart. They have a very different character in terms of where the intensity maxima are located, but also where and in which frequency they, they uh, kind of interact with that particular gain material. So in some ways, you have bright and dark modes being there together, and this is indeed what happens if one looks at, um, sorry, um, at the gain material in itself, where one might ask what type of inter interaction might that feedback provide between these two different mirrors. And in this case, it is provided through the environment of that surrounds the gain material, um, together with the, the fact that we have the bright and the dark modes present in both cases. So if we have these together, in a sense, we can, we can, we can say lasers require a particular gain material, and that gain material is one that can have various forms. It can depend on, on very, uh, on, on, and that by having a different, a different particular semiconductor can have a different color, and in addition to that, by providing a different type of feedback, it can change its behavior also significantly. But all of those lasers that we have so far, they depended in some ways on that very fundamental pr um, property that we looked at, so we looked at, namely it has that gain of material embedded between two different mirrors that then provided the feedback to this. But there's a completely different type of laser out there. One that doesn't rely on mirrors at all. 
And this type of laser is one that one normally associates with a, with a term called random laser. And this random laser is, in its properties, very different. It's because if we imagine that at a certain point, here in this case, a photon is being emitted from an atom and would be progressing along and progressing along a, a certain random pathway between scatterers in this large medium, spontaneously some of those scattered photons may find their way back to where they were emitted. And this finding their way back to where they're emitted is then the feedback mechanism that is responsible for a similar effect as it here in this case for a normal laser. <coughs> but what would happen if we were to think about that feedback the path was smaller. We wouldn't have such a big digression from where the photon was emitted. If the path was even smaller, if you for a moment would think of the photon not, for some reason, moving away from where it has been emitted, would we be able to see a similar effect? As in the case where we saw light being emitted, then propagating forward, being reflected and propagating backwards, has to provide that fundamental element in generating stimulated emission, because you need the photons to, stimulate, to produce more stimulated and emitted photons. So if you think about that question for a moment, what will we need to do with that? <coughs> yeah, well, you might rightfully say, we need to impose a speed limit. We need to tell the lights, please don't move away. Tell it, okay, we need to do something similar to what they do on the M25. You need to go and impose a limit to how fast these photons here may travel on those ways where they are light waves or uh, the, uh, the, the motorways for light or the lading structures. But can we do that? Can we have... <coughs> Can we significantly change the way that light actually propagates in its, in its speed? Well, someone said, no. Einstein was very adamant in saying that, okay, if I wanted to consider light not propagating at all, that would be a rather silly question, because can I imagine that if I was to have light, or he was just thinking about the general theory of relativity, thinking that, if he would move at the similar speed as light, he would see light propagating forward, well, actually not propagating forward, but just bouncing upwards and downwards in its oscillatory way, but on the spot. And he thought, this should not be possible. Well, an experimentalist not too long ago thought, okay, if we disregard that, view for a moment, what would we need to do if we thought we would like to achieve that? And if you look at the fundamental relationship that this group index of refraction has, which determines how the group velocity, sort of the speed of light in a material, represented by that refractive index, and in its proportion on the speed of light in vacuum, depends on the structure, well, we can see that, actually there's a term when we see how that refractive index depends on frequency, its dispersion, we will have a component that represents the refractive index at a particular frequency, what we usually use to. Dispersion means in that case that the speed of light does not depend. Well, if, you ha if I have a dispersive media medium, it does mean that the speed of light depends on its color. And that's what this term here is all about. It says, okay, I have a contribution that does not depend on dispersion, but if I have a dispersive material, then I have a very large contribution that does represent that. And that's what researchers thought was a starting point for doing something about that. Because there's a fundamental relationship, and this is one of the few equations I will, all, I will actually put up today, that li links the real part of the refractive index to the imaginary part of the refractive index, or absorption. Because if you would think of having a transition that was, in its spectral dependence, very narrow, a very resonance transition, that this will, would coincide with a very dramatically steep change of the real part of the refractive. 
if you take the derivative of the spectral frequency, you get a very high contribution of that term. So while this term here, we have our limits to change, because even the most exotic materials, like some oxides, have and do not have refractive indices more than about 100 or 200, which means the speed of light is still 10 to the 6 meters per second, so awfully fast. But here, we potentially have a different way to change the world that light sees. And doing that, researchers at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago, this was in 1999, the cover of Nature showed that cyclists were able to cycle at the speed of light, or rather the other way around. Light was propagating at the speed of cyclists. And the way to achieve that was to achieve a transition in an atomic cloud, an atomic trap, where atoms were brought to such a low temperature, such a small effective temperature, that they would hardly move. And as a result of that, their absorption was very, very spectrally pure. And as a consequence of that, if you remember a moment ago, we said that by a chromos chronic, the real and the imaginary parts were linked. We had a very strong contribution to that. So that experimental demonstration that actually light should be very slow was quite remarkable. But it was also quite remarkable in a second way. It was only a very, very special kind of light. Since that depended on a resonance, and the sharpness of the resonance gave us the opportunity to actually have that contribution, only a very extremely sharp resonance, only a very, very pure color would do the trick. All the other colors would still be fast. So we would have a very selective part of the spectrum of light to do that. <coughs> and all the other colors not do this. At the same time as realizing that this was actually one of the constraints, people also thought, OK, doing that in atoms or in, in, in atomic traps, could we do this in condensed matter systems? And here we come back to those systems that I showed you a little moment ago, namely by digging holes into materials with a certain refractive index, one was able to create effectively a semiconductor for light. And that, in a sense, that potential that had high and low refractive indices created a Bragg wave, and that Bragg wave was, was then responsible for a dispersion of the so-called band structure between the frequency and the wave vector of the way that light propagates. <coughs> Well, normally light would propagate along that line, so-called light line, which would mean that, well, the speed of light determines with a certain refractive index the way it propagated. But since we have partial back reflections from a certain structure along those lines, we will have a selective way that certain frequencies behave in a different way, and that bending of the dispersion relations with this <coughs> defect in that structure allowed us to have a semiconductor-like band gap in the structure. And here, at the band edge, if, re if you remember that the group velocity was defined by taking the derivative of that with respect to, to, the, uh, to the wave vector, then we could see that a vanishing, a van a vanishing um, kind of curvature here would, would, would give us a vanishing uh, group velocity in that sense. So that was a very encouraging approach. Sadly, however, due to the fact that in these photonic crystals, the fact the, that those effects depended on Bragg modes that needed many of these structures to work together, like a periodic crystal of the normal type, small inhomogeneities in the sample that are usually present allowed the refractive index of light not to be, uh, the group index not to be bigger than about a factor of 100. So although this was a dramatic and amazing achievement to achieve that, it was still such that light is still awfully fast. So we thought a little bit, is there a different way? Yes. Is there a different way how to do that? And then we then uh, came up with 
the help of a new type of a new type of materials that was just developed and starting to be developed about ten years ago. These metamaterials. Well, these metamaterials have all sorts of very interesting properties, and while I do not want to go into the details of those tonight, there's one that was particularly interesting and particularly challenging. It was one that allowed light to consist of a so-called negative and a material to have a negative refractive index. And let's for a moment think about what a negative refractive index would actually mean. That's, I'm sorry, I, I'm, as, uh, that negative refractive index would mean if we had water with a negative refractive index, it would mean that instead of a normal behavior, that water would now bend the reflections in the opposite direction to where it would normally exist. And next to very many other quite amazing features on that, it also allowed us to rethink a number of phenomena. And one of those that we later on proposed to harness was one that we, we then uh, termed the trapped rainbow effect. What it means in this case is if we assume that we have a wave guiding arrangement where on the one hand we have materials of normal refractive, refractive indices, normal permittivities, normal, normal, normal permeabilities uh, representing the electronic and the magnetic properties of materials being, being added to an area where we have positive, negative refractive index, positive refractive index, or the other way around, negative, positive, negative. And what would happen in this case is something very similar but different to the way that people discovered quite a number of years ago in the so-called gauss hanshin effect. <coughs> gauss and Hanshin discovered that if a light ray propagating forward and between a material with a higher, with a lower refractive index and a higher refractive index, instead of being reflected on the spot where they would in, where, where they were incident, they would be reflected a bit further forward in the propagation direction. And this way of, and this way of, of doing that was is that in this simple experiment of a, of a glass rod, you would see the light waves propagating forward, but instead of being reflected here, they would propagate a bit further. And this further down propagation of the light fields would then would then allow them to have a peculiar ways of being emitted. So if we, for now, ad adopt this wave, this wave and, and light ray representation of what happens in this structure, we can see that with the particular height, we would have this cause Hanshin shift in forward direction along that, right, uh, along that route. If we now would think about having a negative refractive index in the material, in the middle part, and positive indices at sides, well then this gauss hanshin shift would go backwards instead of going forwards. And the reason for that being is that there is, at the interface, this facial shift in the opposite direction. So the reflections would happen along that way. And the implications for the way that light would propagate along that direction were similar to the way that you would have to encounter when you would move up a very steep hill that would now not consist of any solid material, such as tarmac or stone, but rather something like snow or sand. And you would experience that whenever you would take a step forward, some part of that material would take a step backwards for you. It's a bit like a Sisyphus way of propagating forward, and you can imagine that there may be a condition, if the hill is too steep, that every, every step that you take forwards is counterbalanced by the step that you take backwards. And that's the condition where, effectively, although you would propagate forward, the light would not really do that anymore because the phase difference from that and the other side would prevent you from doing that. And this, if we see that that point where that happens depends on frequency, that which means in typical materials, one encounters a certain sort of dispersion and in the way we showed that at the beginning in the terahertz frequency spectrum, a spectrum where metamaterials in those days were available, good quality metamaterials were very available, one could see that depending on the critical thickness where the light would stop, 
the, the frequencies would stop at different spatial widths of a wedge-like structure, <coughs> and such that the white beam would be disintegrated in its spectral component colors that are similar to, we would see that in, 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 in a rainbow. And that very, and, and this negative phase shift is exactly a way of looking into how effects can happen at interfaces between layers. A similar effect, now not with a negative refractive index, because these are very difficult to achieve on the nanostructure, can actually be, uh, can actually be um, seen in so-called cosmonic nanostructures. But why is that so? Let's consider for a moment. Let's consider for a moment a similar, similarly arranged structure where we have a metal. In this, in this case, thinking of indium tin oxide, a dielectric. In this case, silicon, and then again the indium tin oxide layer on top. So a structure like that would support for light propagating along that direction at a, a number of different so-called modes. And these modes have in their quality a very different type of behavior. There's one that would be guided, it's this one here in the middle, and decaying very strongly in that, and uh, being pre uh, predominantly here in the middle layer and decaying very, very strongly along the metal and others that would be predominantly reflected. But those ones also existing that would be so-called leaky. And these leaky modes are the ones that would be evanescently non-decaying, but rather would leak out to the adjacent layers in a similar way as having the lights to go in and out. We could go also, also think of coupling lights into the system. But the properties of that are very, so, are very closely associated with the fact that at an interface between light, between a dielectric and a metal, a wave of electrons is being excited by the light which is incident. These so-called surface plasma polaritons. What does that mean? If I have light appropriately coupled into that guide, then I will have areas representing the wave propagation along that interface where more electrons are located and where less electrons are located, since they're free to move in that manner. Since I have that imprint of the optical wave onto the metallic interface, that's actually the secret why wavelengths can be so small in nanoplasmonic structures. It is more the limiting factor of the wavelength, the effective wavelength of electrons, not the wavelength of the light incident from the outside but rather the field variations which are much smaller than the wavelength in itself that imprints optics on the nanoscale. So we have a way to make these structures a lot smaller <coughs> and at the same time to exploit the fact that metals have a very particular property. One of those properties of metals, and you might recall that I told you something about a negative refractive index material, was that in order to achieve this, we needed to have a negative permeability and a negative permittivity. If we do not need magnetic effects, we can live with a negative permeability of, um, and permittivity only. And in, th in this case, the fact that having opposing directions of the wave vector of the propagating wave has a very similar effect as, we, as we've seen that in, in the in the trapped rainbow situation. So the result of that being that at the interface between metals and dielectrics, the wave vectors point in opposite directions. So we have an opposite power flow there. And if we do that, we can enge engineer the structure of the material such that the, this is now a rather busy graph of the different dispersion relations. And if you remember how that looked like effectively for the photonic crystal structures, of a dispersion relation that also has <coughs> these stopped light points, points with a group velocity because of the vanishing, vanishing um, group velocity of, of the vanishing curvature would, would vanish. Then you might say, okay, do not have any structure. And that's precisely the point. The difference now being that this dispersion relation is the result of the fact that we have a metal dielectric metal structure with the negative phase shift at the interface, 
has as a result this particular band structure that we have here. So we have an opportunity of lights being stopped. But what do we need in addition to that? Before looking into how that coupling of lights with a game material would, would look like, we can go and see how does that uh, light actually, if it is coupled into appropriately with that certain K vector, behave. And if we look at that and inject with a certain angle representing that K vector into the structure, we can see that the light pulses here, and this is now a computational experiment, although they decay because the system is lossy in terms of of, 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 of losses um, 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 losses in the in the system we have a very very fast propagation of phase but rather a normal decay but not a movement of where the light is located so apparently it stays there where it has been injected and the fact that it does not stay there if I do not do this correctly it can also be seen like in this case if I have a different K vector, it moves away from where it has been injected, and rather swiftly, in terms of about 200 femtoseconds, it's gone spatially. So, anybody exploit that? They recently were able to confirm, and this is like a where, and the idea of the stoplight lasing comes on board. Because if one would now take that principle that we've seen a moment ago, and before we see how we can realize that, we just revisit that again from the perspective of what we discussed at the very beginning. Because what we now need to do is we need only not only need to consider the way that we would have light not moving away, but also light being present in the gain material. So if I have a certain spectral dependence of where light, and this is now the color this one emits, is located or is able to be located, well then I can combine that with a stoplight point, but I can also imagine because this dispersive curve depends very strongly on the thickness of the layers in this waveguide, which is smaller than the wavelength, can be engineered not only to have one stoplight, but as also a second stoplight point. And why do I need that? Because this now allows me to design a structure, which is then arranged in a way that not only one, but two of these stoplight points are in the way as flat as possible in this dispersion relation located within the bandwidth of the gain line. And if we can do that, we can then achieve a large number of K vectors that are combined within that in, in space. K vectors in that, in that sense means the way that spatial modes exist inside of that arbitrary condition. And if we do this, and now look again at our dispersion relation, and now focus on the upper ones, we can again here realize a particular type of mode that we can use. These modes, those are the ones that exist in this metal, insulated metal structure, and arrange them so that they overlap with this gain material, so that they are locked between those. The fact that they are on this side of the light line means that they are the ones of the leaky type, the ones that, while propagating forward, are emitted to the surface or the bottom, if I would arrange that appropriately. These down here are, uh, are of a different type. And if we do this, the, the way that the mode then looks like is that it is guided along that layer structure, but there's this part of the tail being emitted to the surface. Because if we think about that arrangement, we now have to also think about the gain material. We somehow have told you, okay, if I have a structure that does not allow light to propagate, that's okay. But how do I get the light in there? Because I have to pump it somehow. And again, dispersion helps us there. Think for a moment that if we had, <coughs> now in a four-level system, this is more a realistic fiction of a laser because those uh, two-level systems really don't really give us an opportunity to laser because we need an additional, at least one additional level for that. Because if we pump at a certain wavelength of a certain frequency, 
we can associate that, for example, with that frequency where, since we do not have vanishing curvature, the light would still propagate along that direction. It would pump the material, <coughs> invert it, what we need for lasing emission, and then allow then the laser to emit at a wavelength where the emission frequency would exactly coincide <coughs> to these stopped light points. So in other words, the trick, the trick is I am injecting a light beam in order to supply energy and then allowing the gain material to relax in a frequency that conveniently does not allow the light to move away anymore. In this case, we can, can, we can think about realizing a structure where the injection would work, for example, from the side and if we target these leaky modes, the emission would go through the surface. The fact that this actually works and why it works can be checked in the fact that if one then um, thinks how the light line, how the uh, blow up version of here, again, frequency versus wave vector for different levels of pumping would take the system from being lossy to amplifying at a region where these stopped light points represent singularities of the density, of so-called density of, of states, we can see that an average factor of slowdown would be about 10,000 in this case. On the real feedback, what happens at that case, at that point, is to have this black hole-like vortex structure. Because if we look at that, what at this, between these two di different singularities takes place is that reminiscent of the fact that we have these arrows now depicting the way that the so-called pointing vector, the direction of the energy flow inside of the structures go, is that although we are significantly smaller than the wavelength, and although we don't have any feedback in that direction, the fact that <coughs> the phase feedback along the interface provides this so-called vortex-like feeding back of energy inside of these two points. So nanoscopically, once light is in that state, it stays there, spatially. And as a consequence, the feedback is provided by an energy moving upwards <coughs> along that direction, opposite directions between the dielectric and the plasmonic layer, and then coming down and creating this typical type of mode structure. And that localized stop light state is like a singularity vortex by which the light is localized and by which the light stands in order to create lasing. And that in fact this is lasing and that it, it works for realistic conditions by looking into this is now typical internal losses and them being increased by the fact that one deliberately introduces in these simulations interface roughness, interface inhomogeneities the loss rates will certainly increase, but the fact that one still has this localization still works as a result of the fact that we do not rely on our feedback on a structured interface, but rather on one that depends on the dispersion. And if I take that as a basis and see that indeed the overlap of the gain line with the dispersion curve is what provides the intensity feedback in, in that, gives us then the opportunity to really see a typical lasing characteristics that every laser shows. And this is now probably for the first time that I'm actually showing this to you, is the fact that the difference between laser light below a certain threshold is, is that the emission properties of the light that is emitted from that structure is, if it is below that lasing threshold, more realistic of a spontaneous emission process, spectrally broader, and if it is above threshold, the line width will have narrowed to less than the cold cavity line width which would be provided by just the passive stopped light condition that we have imposed on it before. So we have this typical lasing condition being reproduced, and by doing that, we, um, one was able to show, oh yes, although we don't have any mirror, feedback provided by the subwavelength vortex states allows us to think about this new lasing process in terms of a localized way of creating that feedback. And the 
physics behind that localized feedback not only applies to the, the stimulated emission properties, but also to the ones, and this is the remarkable effect on that, to the ones that the spontaneous emission properties have, and those being then depicted on the so-called Purcell factor, which, which uh, gives a bit of an impression of, of how much of that spontaneous emission is actually coupled into the so-called lazy mode. Those of you who are familiar with this, this type of concepts will, will recognize that a very high incoupling of that means, a very high incoupling of spontaneous emitting quantum process into the lazy mode is usually only present and only possible with very, very high pure cavities. A cavity not being present, one may argue, what can one do with that? Well, we can think about a realization of, for example, a tip of a <coughs> mode pumping the material and localized emission taking place depending on where the tip is localized. So we can have the creation of light, the pumping and moving about, but we can also structure the surface so as to create a crystal of light by the way, and in this case, as we proposed it, that to, uh, to, to happen by the way that plasmodic nanostructures would be arranged in a particular spatial way where little light dots would emit in terms of a perfect crystal if that was to be arranged in this, in this way or in different ways. One could also look at another aspect. This is in terms of a little bit of an outlook, an aspect that being a plasmonic structure, a plasmonic waveguide structure, is automatically part of the game. So far, I've kind of talked a lot about photons. I've briefly mentioned the fact that actually at that interface we also have plasmons, actually surface plasmon polaritons. And these surface plasmon polaritons, where I could talk quite at length about those in particular, there are these hybrid states between like a mix between light states and states associated with waves of electrons along the interface. And the one characteristic condition along these <coughs> associated with these surface plasma polarities is the fact that their particular dispersion is not this light-like, but rather the one associated with this curve here being flat. Now, I'm close to the light line, I'm more photonic-like. If I'm over here, I'm more surface plasma polariton like and in passing, we've seen, okay, if we now apply that principle of stopping light, to potentially stopping these electronic coherent waves, what would be the result? Well, if we then change, and this dispersion line depends on the sequence of the layer thickness, where the gain is located, and these thicknesses here, we can change the situation now such that instead of having a stop light point over here, if you remember, those were the leaky ones, we now would have a situation where a stop light point would be here and a stop light point would be there. So what's that, what does that now mean? These excitations at the interface, those are the surface plasma polarities, these hybrid states between light fields and electronic excitations normally propagate forward and normally can't be pumped. They're very lossy in most systems, so they pretty much disappear. Here, in this case, we can do two things. We can amplify them and we can localize them. And in the way that they, they can be localized is such that if we then have an augmented, larger blow-up of the situation over here and over there, we can see that this stoplight point here and this stoplight point here seems to localize these surface plasma polarotons at a certain state in momentum space, in K space in terms of frequency. And that is quite peculiar. And this localization at a finite K space in this case is very much the same as something that was, that was discovered quite a while ago, and namely the condensation of bosons. And this Bose-Einstein condensation was predicted in 1924, first by Boson and then by Einstein in a series of very interesting papers. It was experimentally observed 
quite a bit later. And people have, in this case, a famous picture where if one would go beyond in or colder than a certain temperature for localizing atoms, these, if they were bosons, they would condense into one state depicted spatially. In this case, represented by the distribution of these, because they, they would say, if I would be cold enough, I would be able to have many particles condensing in the same wave function. And as a result of that, the condensation of these into the same wave function, where many particles were just, were, would be described by one wave function, because they were in this one Bose-Einstein condensed state, one was also able to observe so-called atom lasers, by which, when the atoms were allowed to, pretty much by the effect of gra gravity, to drop out of that trap, they would just fall down either in a pulsed or a continuous way, depending on how the opening of that trap was done. And as a remarkable way, when two of them were allowed to interfere, they would depict these interference fringes, demonstrating that actually there is coherence in these atoms. So does that state into which these surface plasma polarities actually come together also represent something which is and I'm having a very strong question mark here because we simply do not know yet. But in effect, similar to the fact that these coherent wave functions seem to be localized in terms of this Bose-Einstein condensate. Well, here we have surface plasma polaritons. They are depicted and described by certain wave vectors and localized in space and in frequency space. And if we analyze how they move in time over a certain spatial extension. Well, if they are very small, in this case, 400 nanometers, we'll see the typical, well, it's difficult to depict, the typical realization of one in the center and some at the, at the sides. But it's particularly if one, if you think about what we've seen before, if we allow them to be a bit bigger, in this case, about one micron in width, they seem to show some structure that evolves in time. This is only 80 picoseconds, a very fast process in terms of a very small scale. By the emitted energy, or by the energy actually, I don't really know how this is emitted, because it's contained in that, in that state, and the inversion, if we now look at a blow up of at 40 picoseconds and at 80 picoseconds over a window of 20 femtoseconds, extremely fast processes on very small scales, we, will, we see that eternally there's a structure that is formed. And that structure has a time dependence and a spatial dependence that depicts the way that these surface plasma polarities are involved. It's probably perhaps the first time that we see from those computational simulations that these surface plasma polarities are present. We don't quite know yet what this means, all we can tell is that they certainly have a state by which they dynamically form and have a coherent interaction. And we'll see whether that question mark can perhaps turn into a full stop or an explanation, exclamation mark, seeing that it, in, it indeed is similar to the condensation of these boson particles into one state. Well, something that we are curious to find out. Quick summary, what I'll try to, uh, try to uh, convey you a bit of a story today. I started out with thinking about something that you can all buy. And I can only encourage everyone, if you do buy them, not to use them in the incorrect way, never to point them upwards when there's anything flying up there. This is, uh, this is a pretty bad offense to be committed by blinding, for example, helicopters or other pilots. So don't do that. They're not so strong. And that because they're built upon the fact that internally these semiconductors that are used in these laser pointers, they very effectively change the electronic energy provided by a battery into light energy. And that the way that this is emitted then represents a different battery. Well, this can be bought and used. The signs of the lasers in, in themselves <coughs> is now in the process of, being, of having something like a renaissance 
in terms of the way where lazing can be observed. The first type of lazing that I briefly tried to outline was the one that would be present or is present in a structure that is more like a metamaterial. And in this case, well, we originally focused into that because we wanted to compensate losses. One can see that bright light and dark light could work together. One of the advantages that that can generate is a very fast lasing oscillation. But perhaps the even more fundamental, the even more spectacular way is to exploit another feature that allows light to be different on scales smaller than the wavelength. In an environment which is very much described by a metal-like structure, namely the fact that the difference in the permittivity between a dielectric layer and a metallic layer allows us to exploit a phase effect and from that to change dramatically the speed of the light propagating. And in combination with gain material, one can then realize a lasing vortex state by which the feedback that is necessary for all the lasing operation is provided on a scale smaller than the wavelength localized and in a quite particular way by linking up the K vectors in frequency spans. So it's a bit like an inverse laser, if you may say. And as a result of that, that in coupling of not allowing the light to go away from where it is generated, not only applies to the stimulated emission process, but also to the spontaneous emission process associated with that. So we have a high in coupling of quantum fluctuations into the lasing mode and can have a variation of that. And finally, maybe as an outlook, opportunities that, since this is a nanoplasmonic hybrid system that is not only li limited to photons, but also to these hybrid states that, being at higher K vectors, can exist on even smaller scales. And with that, I'd like to remain by thanking the sponsors, in particular the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Councils, that have allowed us to conduct that work and the Liba you trust and I'd very much like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much Professor Hess for your talk. Are there any questions? Yeah. So back to the analogy of the light going forwards and then material sliding backwards. Yes. Is it possible, I'm not sure if this is a silly question, is it possible to slide back more? Yes, indeed. If I would, the analogy goes that way, if I do it, if I overdo that, I could think of that effect being such that one would even go the other way around. If we, um, well, we haven't exploited that yet, but in principle, if one follows that, certainly one would be able to reverse the direction because the phase effect, effect would, would, would be so strong. But then, one would need to see what the validity of the approach then still would be. At the moment, we are in a regime where we don't look at that, or not, try not to exploit, but in principle, if you do the analysis and if you have a very strong negative refractive index, you, you can get the velocity even as an overshoot in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, can I ask one more question? <laughs> Knock yourself out. Sorry. Um, so, is it appropriate to think of the light as being stopped or think of it as going round and round? Yeah, yeah. Is it, is well, there's. Uh, yeah, um, I'll go back to this, perhaps this state here. See, somehow, I can't make a laser without feedback. What I'm, what I'm saying, what, what we can do is to provide a feedback without a normal cavity. And this feedback without a normal cavity is what perhaps this kind of vortex state allows us to, to picture. Because the feedback in this case is provided by something which is an in, in, the wavelength would go from here to there. So a normal ray picture would not, certainly not apply 
there anymore. But what, what, what is important here is that it is, it is the field with Maxwell's equations, they do not worry whether something is bigger or smaller than the wavelength. They describe the way that the field, the electromagnetic field, the electrical and the magnetic field, evolve in a certain material or involve in, 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 evolve in free space. And if I have a condition where that phase relationship, and we didn't really have that as an input parameter, but rather as the fact that the material in here would be a metal with a certain dispersion relation, and a dielectric as a gain material in the middle with that particular dispersion that is different from that, allowed this feedback mechanism, which is very much like the way that the light is not allowed to move away from where it is. It's this, you may say, kind of black holeish state, where once it's in there, it wants to stay there. Certainly, you might say, how can we observe it? Well, that's the way it is emitted to the surface in this case. If it's a light laser, and if it's a localized state, well, I would have surface plot mobile terms. I haven't told you yet how to get those out. But that's a bit more of a tricky thing. The energy is localized there, and we would need to see how to couple them out, for example, with a prism or otherwise. But the remarkable fact in that is, is that since I do not have any any cavity, I can also do and apply other principles that in the quantum technologies are very important, like, for example, to imprint some phase memory or some other quantum optical process in a condensed matter system. One can do many body photonics or many body optics by allowing to trick the light by printing it in matter to now being strongly interacting. Because one of the advantages or disadvantages is that here, if we demonstrate that, the light does not interfere. It doesn't, it doesn't influence each other. But sometimes, if you would like to go and influence the way that one light pulse, if it carries information, or if I would like to exploit a nonlinear effect, takes place, I would like to have a strong influence by another light pulse. To switch it off, to change it, to change the information, to imprint information from one beam to another, and many others. And that would be possible by having a material by which, and the coherence properties of the light would be retained, rather conveyed to a different frequency, as one could have a strongly interacting spot of light with a strongly interacting spot on the other structure, and if we then would look into, this is why I sometimes think this is a perhaps this is a best illustration of what one could do if one would if one would now think of having another light spot here one would be able to create something like a light molecule that spot would be able to interact with that one. Pretty much like molecular physics with light. That's one of the things that one can think about. So this imprinting of studying the way that light interacts with matter has a lot of opportunities. Once we can imprint the phase information, the coherence of the light fields onto matter, and then read it out again, which is what allows us to happen via the plasmons and surface plasma polarity. There's a lot of potential in that. Any other questions? So when you couple the light out, what does the kind of beam look like? Is it a green light Gaussian or is that because it's such a small source, do you ever just have a really nice beam or how much information is in it? Interesting. I can't answer that yet. We've just it's just seen that the light does come out. Okay. But it certainly would um, those of you who want to use a laser will want to want to have a good laser. At the moment, at the moment, it's the advantage of that this little structure would have is, is that it, it indeed would provide a source that would be much flatter than any other laser. So it's almost like it's pre-spatially filtered. Exactly. It would be pure near field in some ways. And the so you could use it, for example, if you wanted to have an integrated source on a chip by conveying information from one level to another. 
the present day chips that we have in our mobile phones, they're already three dimensional. And the quest there is to get information like from one end of the city to another end of the city, to get from one side of the chip to the other side of the chip, to go to through those rates. And if you can do this in a broadband way, people hope that they can improve the capacity of the integrated circuit. So we can apply a real science to hopefully change the way that next generation, someone using computers very strongly, computational experiments are then done again, in, in a way. So, but in, indeed, the, uh, the properties of that particular type of light is something we, it's very recent that we actually saw that. Um, so now it's a good time to think about what questions one may want to ask about how is that light behaving, what kind of properties does it have, and, and, and so forth. So very, very valid question there. Okay, let's thank Professor Hess again for the interesting talk. And there is refreshments outside, please help yourselves, and thanks for coming.